Good evening. Uh, by my computer, it is 4.15, and we're going to bring this regularly scheduled Seattle School District Board legislative meeting to order. And uh, before we begin, we want to recognize and honor the First Peoples of the Puget Sound Territories by acknowledging that we are on the land of the Coast Salish Tribes. Additionally, I would like to welcome Rhea Delora, who is joining us on the dais this evening as a student from Chief Self International High School. She'll have a chance to give comments later in the meeting. Thank you for being here. Roll call, please. Director Geary. Here. Director Hersey. Here. Director Burke. Here. Director Harris. Here. Director Pingo. Here. Director Mack. Here. And Director DeWolf is currently out of the country on vacation. For those of you all that wish to, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Superintendent, the floor is yours. <laughs> TV's off. All right, thank you, President Harris. Uh, now it's not working. How do you turn it on? Very high tech yes. here. <laughs> well, how about those mariners? <laughs> Next. <laughs> Next. Thank you. <laughs> nope. Oh, there we go. All right, so just be to begin, I just always want to remind us of our strategic plan priorities, so to ground our conversations um, as much as possible, and our intentionality and focus on these three initiatives uh, for our targeted um, universalism goal of uh, African American boys and students furthest from educational justice. And so those are third grade reading, welcoming environments, culturally responsive professional practice is what we'll be focusing on this year. Um, and as we began to talk about my school visits, I just want to say that October is National Principals Month, and I was really fortunate uh, yesterday to sit with all of our principals at their Leadership Learning Day to thank them in person for the school leadership they provide across this district, the hard work that they put in to make sure our educators feel supported and that quality learning is going on in our schools. And so thank you, principals, um, for all the work that you do. So I have visited two schools so far for a deep dive into the work that they are doing. Emerson staff is getting to know each student as a reader so they can work in partnership with students and families. Principal Rasmussen showed me the PBIS content that staff created and the work that happens in the SOAR block. These eagles are building reading stamina in students, teaching the processes for group work, modeling brave spelling, and assessing students so they know each student's strength and need. The classroom is the center. In the center of the picture is a fourth, our fourth graders talking on big topics like farm workers' rights and racism. It was pretty phenomenal to be in that classroom when they were reading texts about organizing um, and activism. Uh, the teacher sort of leading them in conversation about 
um, working together in teams and what does that mean to be a community builder. He talked to them about that they were community builders and leaders and then they took on those roles and then they had really robust conversations. And the group that I talked to was actually talking about the topic of racism and what that meant to them. And for fourth graders to be diving into that kind of content, it just continually reminds me that they are ready for those conversations and ready to be leaders in those conversations. Um, some of the things that they shared when they were talking about how they can work together were things like one person can't take up the whole time so that we can all talk and we work together to get a solution for what the teacher asked us. And the two pictures on the right are from one classroom in Emerson. There are also two other small groups of students working with an adult on different reading strategies that are not pictured. But the staff at Emerson, um, they're committed to keeping all students in class for tier one reading instruction and using small groups to meet the diverse needs of each learner. One thing that's obvious when you enter the doors at John Muir Elementary is that Principal Ball Cuthbertson and her team find a great deal of joy in their work with students. The staff's intentional focus on African American boys was very evident in the hallways and in the classrooms and as a result, students have had consistent growth in their academic performance scores. Principal Ball Cuthbertson and her team take pride in having staff that look like students and the families that they serve. John Muir is also a beneficiary of multiple Seattle teacher residency staff, and we know that these staff are well-versed in culturally responsive practices, so thankful for the UW and the Alliance for that partnership and continue to see that effort pay off in our classrooms. One observation that I made as I visited classrooms was the tight alignment in both behavioral expectations and content standards. In three different classes, students were exploring the characteristics of igneous and sedimentary rocks. I thought, I, I thought back, I was like, did I get that lesson? I think I was in college when I talked about different Seven? type. No. <laughs> um, they were using academic vocabulary to explain to each other their observations as well as writing their observations in their science journals. And truly, when I was watching these teams work together, they were scientists in action. Um, the staff at John Muir is very proud of the systems that they have created. These consistent expectations keep students in the classroom so they do not miss one minute of instruction. Stuck again. Oh, there we go. Anyway, the work of creating safe and welcoming environments is ongoing and visible in the classroom the classrooms that I visited these last two weeks. Um, I heard in classrooms I heard adults say things like, "As leaders and change makers, what does working together look like?" These teachers chose to use powerful, compassionate words when referring to our learners. Pictured here is a first grade classroom at John Muir Elementary that's closing the day with circle time. Um, they sat, each sat in scholar mode and shared one thing that they enjoyed about the day. So I got to visit at the end of the day. Some of the things they said are, I enjoyed planning games in PE, I enjoyed the yummy food, and I enjoyed writing. I saw a similar closing in the first grade classroom at Emerson the week before. There are, these are the signs in Emerson and John Muir that, on, these are, that were honoring the land and the students' emotional feelings. And so just a lot of great work going on in our schools. Uh, Dr. Mia Williams is leading small cabinet in a book study. And as you can see, we are all very engaged in this work. In this session, each member of the team committed to actions to further the achievement of black boys in our district. And here are a few of the commitments that were written down. I commit to engaging black boys and young men voices, family, and CBO voices in our data gathering methodology. I commit to using an anti-racist lens in my work. I commit to holding myself and others to use affirming language and stop the use of deficit-based language. This is super powerful work for our senior leadership team and I really want to thank Small Cabinet for opening up their practices, making themselves vulnerable in their leadership positions. And I just want to close with some pictures of the black excellence that surrounds us. This super reader read some of his book to me and his favorite staff member at Emerson. 
these, the two brilliant robotics engineers were so enthusiastic in their learning. I asked one of them to promise me that she would never lose her joy for learning. So she, they were sitting in a robotics class, which is a benefit of the Amazon funding that we got. And so those are well underway, those uh, programs and after school programs. And they were just so excited to be having that extended learning that was going on. And it was so evident in our faces. And so I just asked just like, please never lose your joy of learning. And this, uh, the Franklin senior, Jaden Thomas, was just accepted to Benedict College. He was, uh, he introduced the mayor at her budget presentation at Franklin High School. He's a small business owner of Wonder, Wonder Cupcakes by Jay. He's the dance team captain, chairman of the principal's cabinet at Franklin, senior class yearbook advisor, and a huge fan of Beyonce. Um, so we just see the black excellence all around us in Seattle schools, and it's up to us to make sure that we keep them front and center and make it visible. And so thank you, Madam President. Thank you. We are at Roman 3, Board Committee Reports. Who would like to report out first? Director Mack, Chair of Operations, and on the Legislative Liaison. Thank you. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> on the legislative liaison work, uh, we now, ju I just uh, got back from the WASDA Legislative Assembly, which is the Statewide School Directors Association's um, Legislative Assembly. And I, I did send an email out to the school board director sharing the full book of positions that were voted on. Um, it's, it's, it's large. Um, but the it was actually a, a little more exciting than I expected it to be. Um, some great positions were passed that we were expecting to pass. Um, but two things of note, one was that the previous position on pro-statewide bargaining actually came off and was referred back to the legislative committee. So the state school board association no longer has a position saying pro-statewide bargaining at this point. So that's interesting. and. Um, they, there's also an emergency proposal that came forward from five different districts uh, for the review and revision of the prototypical school funding model. And that's the, the funding model that provides allocations for staffing, which is sorely uh, need a, needed needing. It is very low on nurses, counselors, social workers, et cetera. And um, it hasn't actually been changed in 10 years. Um, and so this position, uh, which passed, I proposed an amendment myself to add additional language, not to just reflect mental health and special ed, but also English language learners, opportunity gap, closing services, and safety and security, I believe, um, which is part of the position there. So that was very exciting that that'll be something that comes forward um, in advocacy from a statewide level. The um, state organization then takes what was voted on by the members and it gets ranked and their actual like one pager will come out in about a month or so, um, which I'll share when that comes. Our Seattle Public Schools legislative uh, platform, we adopt one every year for state and federal and um, that's been in draft form. We've been working on it and considering all the other positions and organizations as well and it'll be coming to the executive committee on October 10th, if you're interested in being present to hear that and see that draft, and then it'll eventually come to the full board for approval. Um, and opportunity for you know, revisions to it in the meantime with you know, input from the board. So excited to get that work moving forward um, so that we can advocate effectively with our state legislators. Um, with ops, we haven't had a meeting since last board meeting. Uh, we do tomorrow. 4.30, next door, open public meeting, welcome to come and sit in. We don't take public comment, um, and it is a very full agenda. Um, we will be getting a report from the Bex and BTA Oversight Committee um, about the, their work, as well as I understand they have some recommendations uh, to the board on a couple of different policy things, so we'll be hearing about that. Um, one of the board action reports that's coming is the approval of the ORCA cards contract with the city, I think it is. Um, and 
the big one is student assignment transition plan and boundaries. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, we had a work session last week, Wednesday, where we as a board discussed um, a lot of the proposals in there. We'll be further discussing those recommendations and um, those just to highlight what some of them are is it proposed geozone changes for McDonald and John Stanford, um, the highly capable cohort at Washington and the TAF, how that intersects there, uh, the removal of the spectrum tiebreaker and Licton Springs um, at the new Webster building, moving to the new Webster building. Uh, for the boundary changes, uh, the uh, the maps are now available for the uh, suggested changes for the southeast, which will impact um, Maple, Rising Star at African American Academy, Wing Luke, Kimball, and Dearborn Park. So five schools are going to be impacted by those um, recommended changes. And I understand there's been some working groups from the communities working on those. Uh, they've had some community meetings, and so we'll be learning more in depth about that tomorrow. Um, and we'll also be talking about the policy H13, which is our capacity management policy, and kind of cross-referencing it with four other policies that intersect with um, building usage, uh, so we can kind of understand that, as well as the start of school enrollment uh, projection planning process. Uh, so that'll be a, a fun discussion. I think it will be. I don't know about my fellow board directors, but I'm excited about it. Um, and then just a heads up, uh, coming down the line in December, on December 4th, will be a work session on the BEX 5 implementation plan. Um, so if you're interested in that, that'll be happening in a bit. Thank you. Director Geary, please. Thank you. Okay, I am going to be reporting on Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee meeting. Our next meeting is October 8th. Um, the um, board action report item that will be coming um, and discussed is going to be the modifications to the Highly Capable Services Policy 2190. I know that that's of a great interest to our community. We are getting lots of emails um, about the highly capable cohort and some of the proposals that are being made with regard to restructuring it. Um, so that is probably the most, um, the board action report item that is of the most interest. Um, but we will also be doing approval of the 2019-20 District Educational Research and program evaluation plan, which is also, I think, usually of great interest in terms of the deeper dive. I think that the public often says, you know, what evidence do you have that this is or is not working? Um, how are you going to make sure that you're going to do that across the district? And we, we don't n have the resources always to do that deep dive. So this is our opportunity to shape that and look more closely into our programs in a really um, data-based way. Um, I'm going to be presenting a draft of the anti-racist policy that has been circulating in the district now, getting some input from the staff. Um, it's my hope then to start the discussion on how to um, do a robust community engagement. I mean, that's a, that is a big change. Um, it's been my surprise to find that there aren't a lot of those policies with regard to education across the country. And so this is an opportunity to really, once again, um, do something that could set the stage for a lot of other school districts. So we want to do that well, and we want to engage our public. So that's not a quick conversation. Um, so I'm happy to hear from people on the kind of public engagement they think it merits. Um, then our standing agenda items, um, we have instructional materials, and you will see tonight an introduction that we are bringing the modifications to 2015, the adoption of instructional material policy, and this was a necessary piece. That will be a necessary piece for us to get to the adoption of ethnic studies. And so it's very exciting that we're moving forward on that and that we will then be able to move more quickly and robustly with regard to getting an uh, ethnic studies adoption going. Um, and we've been working a long time on that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, 
So those are probably the highlights of the Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee meeting, and uh, anybody is welcome to attend. Again, that's October 8th. Director Pinkham, Chair uh, of Audit and Finance. Kasia, thank you. Uh, <coughs> our next ANF meeting will be the day before the CNI on Monday, October 7th, and we have three bar uh, items uh, <coughs> to cover that day. Uh, the first one is going to be the state auditor Otter's office contract was as an annual requirement, so if you have to get that done. Uh, there's also a renewal of the Microsoft software agreement to make sure we have those resources for our students and staff and other employees of the uh, school district. Uh, the third one is deals with the new healthcare system, uh, so we'll have a bar on the benefits contract to discuss, uh, so if people are interested in hearing what's discussed on those issues, please attend. Uh, special attention items include uh, contracts exceeding 250K for our special education needs, uh, follow up on the Thornton Creek, um, an MOU um, <coughs> policy follow up, uh, the community eligibility program, uh, follow up with the United Way breakfast. We want to see you know, kind of what happened there, get an update as to why and maybe how we can continue that program. The fiber credit will be discussed. Uh, the SAP human resources and payroll services, uh, a fairly new system for us and having the staff that we have to make sure that uh, things are going well. Uh, also have an update on the operations levy certification from uh, <coughs> our chief financial officer uh, <coughs> that day. And other items just uh, are included in our annual committee work plan. Uh, and notice that we do have the December 3rd quarterly audit meeting coming up, uh, which Andrew and I were kind of confused uh, who was going to be there. You know, if our official day on the board for those not running for the office again is going to be that oath of office the day before, <laughs> who's going to jump in the, the next day? So, uh, so we'll be following that, get some clarification on that. Uh, also, uh, Andrew Medina will be doing his annual report to the board, uh, I believe either later this month or uh, in November, and he's asked that when he does that, that it be part of the board committee reports versus a separate item, so he'll just follow up with me on that. Uh, and that is the report from a &F. Thank you very much. Okay, and when he does that report, if we could call it out in the agenda, be grateful for that. Absolutely happy to meld it in with the ANF, but it should be line itemed on the agenda. Uh, the next executive committee is, I believe, October 9th. I, Director Mack, I think you said the 10th. Want to make sure that it's the 9th? It is the 10th. It's on Thursday. Well, and there you go. And that's why this is a team. Thank you. Um, scheduled for that, again, it's a public meeting. It's at 8 a.m. until 10 a.m. And uh, we will be hearing about our legislative agenda from Eden and Jill and from our um, very capable staff as well. Our lobbyist will not be here because he's traveling. But um, it's an important conversation and it's a short conversation because of how much we have to pack into two hours and as we wrestle over the agenda items, it's, uh, it's a push me, pull you for sure. Okay, we're also going to be discussing potentially raises for non-representative staff. And we're also going to keep on the legislative, uh, the executive committee's agenda, uh, reconfiguring these legislative meetings, whether we start them later, whether we um, set aside some of the public testimony um, slots for particular issues such as race and equity or strat plan issues. Continuing important issues that if they are not on the agenda, they're still going to be addressed on a regular basis. This has been from strong community input. And hopefully by the next legislative meeting, we will have, as I referred to at the last legislative meeting, a new bar that uh, addresses the legal requirements for First Amendment rights in public testimony. And I see Chief Counsel Narver, you wanna wave please, so folks know who you are. Started on September 3rd, uh, agreeing with me there, so that we are in conformance with state and federal law. Uh, still talking about board and staff communication and uh, 
they are very intense and very quick moving meetings and we have standing items, community engagement, communications, uh, strat plan updates, et cetera. And you are more than welcome to attend. Next we come to student comments. And I get to read a little bit about you and then the floor will be yours. And I might add that you can stay as long as you like. You don't get to vote, but you get to ask questions from the dais as if you were a board member. So, Ms. Delora is a junior at Chief South International High School and enrolled in the full IB diploma program. She also participates in mock trial, band, and other extracurricular activities. And since I live two blocks away from Chief South International High School, my brothers and sisters all went there, and my daughter graduated there. Welcome, go Seahawks. Um, hi, my name is Ria Delora. Um, so I've been going to Chief South for two years. This is my third year. As she said, I'm a junior, um, and I can confidently say sitting up here that I am proud to be a Seahawk. Um, Chief South boasts one of the most diverse and engaged student bodies in the entire district and watching my peers and classmates and people that I see on a daily basis taking the steps to, be, to develop their skills and their education is really inspiring every day. Um, so Chief South pioneered the Sakashi program for indigenous students to explore, understand, and share their culture. Um, both of my brothers are in the Sakashi program and many other students that I've spoken to really find enrichment from getting to spend time with other native students who maybe haven't been able to explore their culture as much. Um, South is also one of only three schools in the district that offers the IB program. So that's a rigorous two-year course that allows students to really explore what it means to be an academic and what it means to learn and what it means to grow. Um, and I've only just begun the IB program, but I've taken previous IB classes and I can say that like, I really feel that what I'm doing now at school, going to high school every morning is going to set me up for success and that I'm given the opportunities to go down the path that will lead me to have a better life later. Um, South also offers multiple academic extracurriculars or extracurriculars that are geared towards learning, including mock trial, which I'm in ethics bowl, Feast, Green Team, Key Club, and many others. Um, alongside the extracurriculars, South is also has a very consistent and persistent music program. So we have ensembles such as our concert and our marching band, our orchestra, our choir, our mariachi band, and our jazz band, which has inspired many students to form their own smaller groups to explore the music they want to be playing and they want to be hearing and they want to share with other people. Um, so throughout like my time at Chief South, I've met some of the brightest, most inspiring, most engaged and passionate people I think I ever will. Um, even though there's a lot of uh, financial issues and a lot of students just aren't on the same they haven't been given the same opportunities because of the families they were born in the areas they live in. Uh, given the opportunity, no matter what student you have in front of you, if you give them something that they can be passionate about and love, everybody's going to find something to do. And um, SELF really gives the opportunity for so many different students in so many different areas of learning and expertise and everybody to make their own choices and to come on their own paths. Go Seahawks. <laughs> Thank you for that. Watch out, Franklin. Chief <laughs> Self International High School's uh, mock trial team's coming for you. Uh, directors, do you have questions, comments for our guests? Director Pinkham, please. Welcome, uh, Ria. My question is going to be about you know, what are your plans after high school? Do you know what you're doing? And uh, do you have a tribal affiliation? Just curious. Um, yeah, so my dad was native um, and he was in the Brothertown Indian tribe in um, the Dakota area. So me and my brothers are all registered under that tribe. Um, but we don't connect very much with it very much because we live with um, members of the family on my other side of the family, my white side of the family. 
Um, for me, college and four-year university has never really been an option. It's something that was almost expected, and as I've grown and understood like what learning and knowledge means to me, it's like I feel nothing but the desire to go to a four-year university. And um, I would love to work in an area such as like curation for like art and history because I'm really passionate about understanding our roots and understanding where we come from. Um, and math, I like math a lot. <laughs> yeah, math is my thing. Expect to see your application to the University of Washington then. <laughs> we'll see. Catch this man at uh, break because he is a mentor to a great many University of Washington students at the university in the College of Engineering and, and also works with the Native programs there as well. And when you hire Scott as your mentor, you get him for <laughs> life. <laughs> Other uh, directors, comments, questions, concerns? Well then, thank you. Please thank you. continue to stay if you'd like. And if you have homework, we understand. <laughs> thank um, you. So we are at board members reports out. Who would like to go first? Go, Director Burke. Good evening. I will uh, will will lead off this comments thing. I've got a few things prepared. It's it's only been two weeks since we were last together. Um, much has happened, but two weeks ago, we uh, we nominated this gentleman, which I'm proud to sit next to. So it's going to be tough to one up that for this meeting. I don't I don't think we've I don't think we can. But um, that was super exciting and. I'm all the conversations we've had since then just reassure me that, that uh, he's going to be a great colleague and, and a, a great representative for, for D7 and for the city. Um, some other things, we had a uh, couple of work sessions uh, on advanced learning and student assignment transition plan. Uh, I'll touch on those issues a little bit more specifically. Uh, one of our partners, the Port of Seattle, hosted uh, an event. The, it was their Maritime Secondary Education Summit. Um, and I, I'll, I'm not sure if other directors want to expand on this. Uh, I had the pleasure of joining Director Mack and Director Geary. This has been a, an area of passion, the, the intersection of, of career and technical education and our maritime region um, and our partnership with the Port of Seattle. And they're really trying to explore what are the possibilities, what do funding models look like, what do partnerships look like. Uh, so it was a really great event. I was only able to be there for the first half of the day. I think my, my colleagues were able to stay longer. I was thrilled to be able to attend that. Um, we had a board retreat um, and got to do a deep dive into our strategic plan. Um, and I'm really, really thrilled about where our strategic plan has, has come from, how it's evolved, and what it looks like now. Um, you know, the, the messaging around it, the branding around it, the enthusiasm around it, the initiatives within it, um, I think are really strong. And I want to commend uh, Superintendent Juno and staff for putting that together. Some of my reflections from that retreat, um, when we were talking about Seattle excellence, um, I have a, an internal a belief or opinion or sort of a learned experience of, in my mind, what that looks like. What does Seattle Excellence look like for me, for my family? Um, and what we, what the conversations we had there and the conversations around black excellence were really eye-opening and mind-opening. Um, and Superintendent Juno mentioned some of that in her, her opening comments as well. And I just want to encourage all of us to keep having those conversations about how do we define excellence, not so much to put it in a box, but to open each other's minds because I confess to coming into the conversation with a particular perspective, and that makes it really difficult to implement policy work and decisions when you're coming from an, uh, a limited mindset. So how do we define it? How are we measuring excellence? Because the measurement of excellence, you know, we, we need to be putting our racial equity lens on this. We need to be making sure that we're um, really sensitive to other cultural viewpoints. Um, what tools or processes do we use to measure? And then how do we celebrate, motivate, and develop excellence 
in our students. And I think that was like the, the real nut that came out of it. It's like, yeah, we, we want this excellence. We have to agree what it is in all its different forms and um, figure out how to get our students there um, and celebrate when they're there. Um, other topics. Um, I think there's, there's some, some conversation around nutrition services. Um, and I want to apologize to any of our families that have, um, have had less than satisfactory experiences um, with nutrition services. I think we've put in our strategic plan um, an intent for consistent and predictable operational systems. We think about our transportation. We think about our nutrition services. These are bedrock items that we should we should deliver, they should be reliable, and I know that staff is working to, um, to make sure we get that right. Um, we, we don't want problems like that to become um, recurring. So apologies, and thank you for your patience. Um, the, one of the topics that came up at our work session around the student assignment transition plan, I want to be very, very clear that we have a really challenging um, decision or choice that we're looking at um, that is not particularly desirable in any way. Um, we have overcrowding at McDonald Elementary. Sorry, we have overcrowding at Green Lake Elementary. And if we increase the geo zones for McDonald and John Stanford, we may alleviate that overcrowding slightly. So that's a potential positive. But really what we should be doing if we're following our, our equity commitment is we should be shrinking those geo zones and we should be increasing our set aside for heritage speakers at, that, at those schools to celebrate the diversity, help those programs thrive, support more students farthest from educational justice. The challenge is if we do that, we are gonna hurt Green Lake Elementary in a big way without another fix. So I'm, confess that as a director, I'm really struggling with how to, how to move forward on that, and so I really appreciate the hearing from community about pros and cons of the different areas. Um, the last one I'm gonna touch on is highly capable services and advanced learning. Um, this was also a, a rich discussion um, that we had at our, our work session on this topic, um, and I think it's really clear that it's a highly racially unbalanced program. That is, um, and so I think the questions, there's so many questions around that, the whys, the what do we do about it, do we balance it or do we restructure it? Um, is it actually serving students or is it just perpetuating stereotypes? Um, and the point that I brought up at that work session that I wanna reiterate here is that yes, that is important, that is work we have to do, but I do not believe that that is our immediate moral imperative. I believe that our immediate moral imperative is our students farthest from educational justice and the ones that we're talking about serving through the multi-tiered systems of support that we've been working on. You know, this is a policy that we put in place in 2011. We have funded it, we have committed to it, staff has been working on it, we're doing professional development around it, we made a SMART goal around it. This has been and should be the mechanism to support our students in schools, um, both when they're below proficiency and when they're above grade level proficiency. That's the structure that we're talking about as a vehicle. Um, and so I think it's incumbent on us as a district to prove to our families that that system works, that it can work, that it does work, and that we have the ability to implement that across the district because that will provide the confidence to our families <coughs> that are looking for services at all levels. So the fix for advanced learning is really to fix our core instruction um, because we've got such a wide range of students that we're asking our educators to differentiate. <coughs> it's really hard for say a third grade teacher to provide effective learning environments for a student that's still learning to decompose numbers into single digits and in the same class, students that are doing operations with fractions. It's not fair to the educator, it's not fair to the students, 
And so we have to figure out how to, how to, how to close that gap, how to get our students at proficiency and not have that level of differentiation needed in the classrooms. That's core instruction. That's what core instruction will do and can do. To close that topic and, and to talk about why it's such an imperative, we've talked about our third grade reading goal for African American boys. Um, Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction has uh, data that they maintain for black African American. It doesn't isolate boys and girls. That's a deeper granularity than what, what you can just get off the website. But OSPI data from five years ago um, had 28% of our third grade African American students meeting proficiency in reading, 28%. In, t in five years, that number has increased to 38%. It's an increase, but it's unacceptable. We have a strategic initiative that is absolutely focused on that and I believe it will drive that improvement. But I want to throw another stark data point out there. Five years ago, 25% of our African American students were meeting math proficiency. What is that number today, five years later? It's 27%. Three quarters of our African American students in third grade are not at math proficiency. And so we, we're letting these students down. So my, my, my ask is that we focus on those students, we focus on the MTSS structure, and we demonstrate that we can bring those students farthest from educational justice, from where they are, from where they've been historically, to where they are knocking it out of the park. Last thing, uh, community meetings. I have two, one October 12th. Greenwood Public Library, uh, Director DeWolf has indicated he will likely be there. I, I want to let him confirm that, but I believe um, October 12th, 10 o'clock, Greenwood will be a twofer. And then my last meeting of my term will be November 9th, also at Greenwood Library, 3 to 5 p.m. Thank you very much. With Chief Counsel, I put board members reporting out before consent agenda. I'm okay with that, aren't I? Thank you, sir. Next up, please. Director Hersey, thank you. Hello. Okay, fantastic. Um, first up, thank you so much for all of the warm welcomes, both in person and uh, via my inbox. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, we have definitely hit the ground running. I have spent uh, probably the last four hours for the last, oh goodness, eight or nine nights uh, meeting with different uh, chiefs in the cabinet. And I have learned and continue to learn so much about all of the amazing work that our district is doing. And um, even beyond that, all of the amazing work we're going to continue to do and I'm excited to be a part of. Um, I wanted to extend a thank you to uh, Director Harris for inviting me to her community meeting. It was wonderful uh, to have conversation around advanced learning and boundaries, and uh, the lasagna smelled great, even though I could not partake. Um, and I am excited to continue to do those community meetings uh, for myself moving forward. And I've got a couple that I'm going to announce a little bit later on in the comments. Uh, something that I'm really excited about is a l few families have reached out concerning the boundary changes that are going to be affecting the southeast um, as the aforementioned uh, elementary schools um, earlier in the comments. And uh, if you would be interested in walking some of those proposed routes, I know that I have um, a time set up with a family this Friday. Um, but if you would like to get a chance to have a conversation so that I can walk the route with you and your family or maybe some other community members, I would be more than happy to take the time to do that. Uh, just shoot me an email and we will find a time to connect um, just so that I can get a better idea of what those changes mean for you and yours. Um, and it would also be a cool opportunity to meet some of your kiddos and have some deeper conversations about, um, you know, what this is going to look like for your families. Um, so two community meetings that are coming up. Um, a big one focused around boundaries is going to be happening on October 10th from 6.30 to 8.30 at Mercer Middle School. I unfortunately will not be able to join in person. I will be at my sister's wedding. 
Um, but I will be joining electronically from Atlanta, Georgia. It'll be a late night, but I think that it is important for me to be present. And I think that we're also going to be looking at opportunities to set up an additional meeting to um, get more feedback. And so those are still in the works, so be on the lookout for those. My personal <coughs> committee, excuse me, my personal community meetings, I've got two on the calendar, and I'm going to be committing to two or three community meetings a month going forward just so that I can do everything I possibly can to meet everyone who would like to come out and share their thoughts and opinions and ideas and things like that. Um, so the first two I've got set up, the first one is going to be uh, at the Beacon Hill Library on Sunday. That is going to be October 20th from 3.30 to 4.30. Hopefully, they'll let us stay a little longer. It's surprisingly difficult to book community meetings a couple of weeks in advance, uh, which is great because I'm glad that folks are using our libraries to their full capacities, but it is also difficult to find public meeting space. So we're going to be looking out some more creative options. Um, and then the next meeting is going to be at Rainer Beach Library on October 31st, and I know that's Halloween. We're going to have candy, uh, um, so come through if you would like, and that's going to be from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Um, like I said, I want to commit to having a diversity of community meetings and a diversity of locations, both on the weekend and on a weekday at different times of day. I want to make myself as available as possible. So please, if you have an idea for times that work best for you or a location that is public and large, uh, don't hesitate to email me. My email is up and running, and you can find that on the website. Uh, the next piece was I really enjoyed getting to spend some time with the NAACP uh, Seattle King County chapter that met here at the John Stanford Center last week. Um, it was really great, Superintendent Juno. Uh, joined us along with um, Dr. Mia Williams and um, a few other members from the cabinet. And it was just really amazing to see and get a lot of ideas around how we can continue to partner with um, an organization like the NAACP, especially when we're thinking about, you know, the goals that we've set for ourselves in our strategic plan. Um, I really see those community partnerships as being crucial going forward and continuing to build those relationships and to unsilo our learning and, you know, connect on those deeper levels is going to be something that I'm going to be excited to be a part of. And um, yeah, I hope to see some of my fellow board directors at a few of those meetings going forward. Next up, the board retreat was amazing. It was so much fun to get to spend some time um, learning more deeply about the work that is going on in our district. Um, and I'm just excited to continue that. Uh, so thank you for all of those who were present. And thank you very much. I believe it was the Meany Drumline. That, um, be the BWB Meany Drumline. They're amazing. Uh, however, we can continue to support and uplift and showcase their work. Um, Definitely interested in doing that. Uh, also had the wonderful opportunity to attend a family engagement event at South Shore. Um, I was invited by, again, Dr. Mia Williams and Dr. Keisha Scarlett. Those spaces are so much fun to be a part of because you just leave feeling uplifted. And, you know, it was such an amazing event that was done in partnership with Rainier Scholars. Um, and I actually learned a lot of things that I took back to my classroom the next day, and it has improved my instruction. So uh, not only things that you can use at home, but also things that can be used in the classroom and vice versa. I believe strongly the more we break down those barriers between home and school, um, the more amazing outcomes we're going to see for our kids. Um, and that about wraps it up for me. Like I said, please, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, do not hesitate to email me. And I look forward to continuing to connect with our community and to get it done for kids. Thanks so much. Director Geary, to round out, to round out this side of the dais, um, <laughs> just doing boom, boom, boom. Um, I too attended the Maritime Secondary Education Summit um, with Directors Burke and Mack. A huge appreciation to Port Commissioner Ryan Calkins, who has been, um, I think, fascinated uh, and really enthusiastic about how to combine the port's resources with Seattle Public Schools to create exciting education options for our kids. And I think um, it was, for me, a really eye-opening experience to bring in so many of the different groups in Maritime outside of education um, and see them interact with the people who work in education and see that the culture shifts that we've worked so hard to create within Seattle Public Schools um, definitely need to take place 
within our partners as well. And to see the exposure to some of the ideas that we take for granted was fascinating. Um, to see different people from different groups stand up, be it the longshoremen or people in education or students of color who have gone through the program and talk about their expectations, the changes in the industry, the changes in the um, apprenticeship programs, um, culture differences, and to see that conversation start was super exciting for me because it's going to be a really important conversation that if you want people to show up, you need to think about what's going to make a warm and welcoming environment for them. And that looks really different, perhaps, from the historically um, union setting as to what tomorrow's union setting has to look like and, and what kind of what the students need. And one of the most interesting comments that was made was by a young man and who said, um, you know, in my community, it can't be about delayed gratification. And that doesn't, for a lot of us, I think that sounds like, oh, well, that's the cornerstone of hard work and you have to work hard and hope for a reward down the line. But then he followed it up with something that was really important to, for me to hear and I think for a lot of people in the room to hear and that was that when you go home and the lights are being turned off or you've got to figure out where your next meals come from or the, the, the problems of your day-to-day -day life are immediate. And so delaying gratification, you, you can't wait because you'll be gone, you'll be homeless, you'll have to move. So that we have to think about what it is that the kids that we want to reach need now in order to stay engaged. And that if we're setting up systems that assume that they have the stability and the base to wait for a payoff at some point in the future, that we may be losing them and then turning around and, and making um, a judgment call as to them that just isn't fair. And it was a really great comment to think about in that context. Um, and so it is those culture shifts that are going to need to take place for us to create even the warm and welcoming environments within our own school district. So um, another, I'm just gonna tie it in with another theme that I've been seeing more and more in just these conversations, and that is the idea of discomfort. And so when we see those those moments where our assumptions are being challenged and what we took as sort of the truths, uh, the rights, the norms are being dismantled by people, it's gonna feel uncomfortable and that's okay. That has to happen for this change to happen. So be sure when you feel the discomfort within these conversations, don't hide, don't back away, don't be necessarily become defensive live with it and you'll see that you survive and that the next time you're in a situation you might find that you it doesn't feel as discomforting and that your perspective has changed. So those are the thoughts that I've been coming up with in so many of these conversations and places that I've had the opportunity to go into. Today I got to the, um, I got to attend the uh, Seattle Arts and Lectures Luncheon to support the WITS program, which is Writers in the Schools. And I was very embarrassed when asked, did you know about this program? And I said no, um, because we have so many programs and so many partners. Um, they don't necessarily play as prominent a role in the schools in my district, but they are there. Um, and it was with great pleasure that I got to meet uh, Wei Wei Li, who is a student at Nathan Hale High School, who is the 2019-20 Poet Laureate for Seattle. And so there's just such great work going on, and it was, it was, it was my honor to get to meet her. It was my honor to support that program. And it did make me remember that there was a time when we would bring in our partners on a regular basis and they would tell us a little bit about their programs during our meetings. Um, I think that that's an incredibly helpful thing to the members of the board 
to know what different programs and what different partners are and get to share the good news, the good work that we have going on in our schools. And I just, I don't, um, we're not doing that as much anymore. And I think I missed it and I, I hadn't realized it was gone until that moment. Um, I continue to have my breakfast coffees at Zoka on Blakely behind the University Village. Uh, the next one will be October 8th, next Tuesday morning. And then the one after that is going to be October 29th because I, I have um, engagements in the middle of the month. But they're 8 to 9.30. We always have a group of people who are pretty well versed in education in Seattle Public Schools. So um, it's a great time to just talk education and drink some coffee. Thanks. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Director Pinkham, please. <coughs> Thoughts go out. Uh, good evening and thank you. Uh, sorry I missed the board retreat. Uh, I was uh, had the, actually the honor to deliver the eulogy for my uh, father-in-law as they spread his ashes out in the sea, out, out the Oregon coast. So, um, although I wasn't at the meeting, I'm glad to hear that it uh, you did some fantastic things, or you feel that things went right. Uh, the Advanced Learning Task Force. Um, appreciate what they're doing and what you'll continue to do because uh, you know, I do see that we still need some you know things to do and hopefully as we go through this process we'll be able to make some strides that we've been missing you know I do want to see more of our underserved students getting identified as HCC or advanced learning and how we do that sometimes we can't just keep on trying to retest retest maybe it's a test <laughs> that isn't doing us service. And this kind of brought me to thinking about the idea uh, where I'm at the University of Washington College of Engineering. We're trying to get away from are students ready for college? It's more is the college ready for students? You know, so we are definitely looking at the lens of how we define success for our students a lot differently these days. And I think as we look at what our goals and we say you know, that we want to make sure our students are college and career ready. Um, I just want to make sure that they're successful and that success is going to be defined separate by each student, each family, each community, what's going to make them successful, uh, which brought me back to, if I can bring this up here, excuse me. What I brought up at the last meeting, and I wanted to read this quote from, again, this is William Wolf, who is a former president of the National Academy of Engineers, and he's looking at engineering, and where I say engineering, you can put in education, uh, so uh, please bear with me. <coughs> and he says, many people talk about the need for diversity as an issue of equity in terms of fairness, and that is a potent argument. Americans are very sensitive to issues of equity and fairness, so the fairness argument resonates with many people but I will make a different argument today. A second argument for diversity has to do with numbers, the fact that white males are becoming a minority in the population of the United States, and that unless we include more women and underrepresented, underrepresented minorities in the engineering workforce, we're simply not going to have the number of engineers we need to continue to enjoy the wonderful lifestyle we've had for the last century or so. This too is a potent argument, but is not the one I'm going to present today. My argument is essentially that the quality of engineering is affected by diversity or the lack of it. To make that argument, I'm going to share with you the, some of the very deep beliefs about the nature of engineering, some of which <coughs> run counter to stereotypes of engineers, engineers and engineering. The whole argument in a nutshell is this. It hinges on the notion that engineering is profoundly creative prof profession, not the stereotype I know, but something I believe deeply. The psychological literature tells us that creativity is not something that just happens. It is all of making unexpected connections between things we already know. Hence, creativity depends on our life experiences. Without diversity, the life experiences we bring to an engineering problem are limited. As a consequence, we may not find the best engineering solution. We may not find the elegant engineering solution. So the more voices we include at the table, the better solutions we'll find. <coughs> I also want to make announcements. Uh, UNEA is having some restorative justice workshops this weekend. Uh, the first one is on Saturday at the Green Lake Library from 11 to 4. And they did secure a second uh, spot to do it on Sunday from 12 to 4 at Holler Lake Community Club. Uh, this is for ages 12 and up. There are no 
<coughs> Native Warriors Athletics, ages 9 to 14, will be on Sunday as well, October 6th from 6 to 8 p.m. <coughs> They're also having uh, the debut of their Link to the Springs documentary uh, the end of the toward the end of the month on October 26th from 1 to 3 at the Seattle Central Library. Uh, so it encourage people to go out and participate in what UNA has to offer. And also want to announce that Hachusada PAC elections are also going to be on October 17th from 5 to 6.30 at middle, Meany Middle School. So uh, for those that have 506 form students uh, enrolled in the schools, you know, please head out there and make your voices heard. Uh, I will have <coughs> community meetings this month, October 19th from 10.30 to noon at the Lake City Library. And then my last one will be November 16th, also from 10.30 to noon in just <coughs> District 2, Rick Brooks uh, area at the Greenwood Library. And those times are posted on the district website. Katsiayo, thank you. Thank you. Director Mack, please. Uh, since I gave such a long committee report, I'm going to try to be relatively brief um, since we're going to run into community comments, and I really like hearing from the community. Um, and so first off, I have a community meeting uh, on the 19th from 11 to noon at Magnolia Public Library. I hope to see you there. Everyone is welcome. You don't have to be just from my district. I'm happy to, uh, I would, am very interested in hearing other perspectives as well, not just from the district. Um, congrats to the principals on Principal Month. Thank you for mentioning that, uh, Superintendent Juno. I also uh, appreciated hearing um, the comment from the student that was, uh, I think you, you said it was part of their PBIS work, which the acronym, just for folks that don't know, that's Positive Behavior Intervention Supports, and it's a program to support communities and students in being um, uh, productive and have great cultures and be positive. Um, and so I really liked hearing the work together and let everyone speak part. I think that's just really meaningful, and I think that's something that as we move forward into our um, challenging discussions around how to solve some of our hardest problems that we need to remember that, um, that it's important to let people speak, respect them, even if you don't agree with them, and that we need to be working together to come to these solutions. Um, and, um, you know, I reiterating the sa safe and welcoming environments, you know, I want that for our district. I want everyone to feel welcome and that their voices are being heard, and um, uh, just I just want to, I'm glad that we are continuing that commitment. Um, the board retreat, uh, it really was fun to have the, the drumming. Um, and uh, let's see here, I, oh, thank you for mentioning the Maritime Academy. Um, uh, I'm sorry if I'm forgetting the name of the day long. Um, Stakeholders group, right? But it, but it but it really was great to have all of these people in the room that are really interested in bringing together um, thoughts and resources to do something to support the maritime industry as well as support students in in maritime as well as support our CTE. And you know, one of the things that I learned, which was really interesting, was that that came up was that CTE courses actually are advanced courses in some cases like you need to be taking an advanced math to be doing um, to be doing some of the courses and it's just it was just really wonderful to realize that we actually have all of these additional advanced learning opportunities that we need to be tying into all of our programs um, and that I think we need to explore that further especially at, at high school um, and it, I also found it really interesting that, in general, the word cohort program came up a number of times in support of the concept. And it's interesting to think about that and, and the impact that that can have um, on a system. And what, what does a cohort mean? Um, and how do you create that in a racially equitable manner? Or do you have, you know, can you, can you run into issues with, with that? Um, and I think we can. So it's an interesting conversation. Um, and um, let's see here. So I think that was all of the little things I've noted down to talk about. Um, and I look forward to hearing from all of you tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for being here.
very much. Um, last Saturday was fun. Director Hersey, and it was, it was nice having you right alongside. And I'm sorry you didn't get the lasagna. No carbs for you. <laughs> Next time you have to tell me these things. Um, and if any of the vegans had shown up, I'd have made you a separate one. But that's not the issue. My next community meetings are October 19th, 3 to 5, High Point Library. That's 35th Avenue Southwest and Raymond Southwest Raymond Street. And November 16th, 3 to 5 at the Del Ridge Library. Um, the BWB Meany Middle School drum line and the exercises on that and with some of our staff that participated was a blast and I nominate that for probably the most fun icebreaker and uh, I fulfilled one of my fantasies. <laughs> okay, um, great conversation was had on the strat plan and it's it's unusual to have all of us together in jeans with some time to talk about how we get there from here. And, and it's a luxury, frankly, with everyone's schedules. And, um, and it was nice to dig deeper to get there. Um, I, I am most interested as well as, as per usual in getting more of the fiscal impacts of all of the different pieces to the puzzle because there are ever so many of them. Um, advanced learning, great work session on Wednesday night and what it said to me is just how much farther we have to go. Um, I continue to be distressed that for 20 years we have done testing, testing that is culturally inappropriate at best we have not tested single domain learners. We have not figured out ways to meet the needs of uh, twice exceptional children, children that are ever so talented but also need uh, special ed support. And, and that's, that's on us and it's also on the lack of money. But I am very excited to see the deep dive that's being made. I am extraordinarily grateful for staff's work and putting together that notebook that has uh, research and, and I suspect that Director Geary had a lot to do with that as well and I appreciate it, thank you very much. Um, I, I always go back to public television and the kids shows and the commercials to read more about it and now we hit a, a website link but, but to be able to take home peer reviewed literature is, is hugely helpful. Um, also was pleased to attend most of the meeting on Monday afternoon at Washington Middle School with Superintendent Juneau, Special Advisor uh, Sherry Cox, Chief uh, HR Officer Clover Codd, and uh, Director Sarah Pritchett to speak with the staff about the potential of the Technology Access Foundation coming to Washington Middle School. There's been a great deal of information swirling about and I believe this might have been the first time that they had an opportunity to answer questions in a safe space. And um, the TAF team, and, and it's always easy to go to a fallback position and talk about Trish Tezikos Molinas, but it's not just Trish Tezico Molinas, it's the TAF team. And she had her top folks there as well. And it was a productive conversation and there are things to work out. SEA attended as well and, and there was good, thoughtful, robust conversations, so stay tuned. Uh, the other piece of that and both from my Saturday community meeting and a very high volume of uh, emails, if we enter into a partnership with Technology Access Foundation then we need a plan B potentially for pathways for the highly capable cohort for the South End. And every one of these problems, or I'd like to say opportunities, have enormous layers to them 
and and again i wish that i had one of those rubik's cubes that i gave away to staff several years ago at our first retreat because every time you move one element you move ten others and that affects ten others i think of it as i think it's the hydra where you cut one branch and two grow back and then four etc um, it's complicated hang with us and when you give your feedback please also give us constructive ideas because we really truly want to hear them and now we're going to take a stretch break until 5:30, at which time public testimony will begin promptly Thank you.